Um, no concept of what lay ahead of them in 1835. Just, just imagine, like, this is an area that gets devastated by the famine. Um, but no, no, everything that happened subsequently, um, they just couldn't have imagined. Um, so the life originally seems to go well. Thomas Madigan, who fights here, is born in 1840. James Jr. in 1841. Catherine in 1845. And then 18, uh, 1845 is the failure of the, the potato uh, crop. Uh, and everything disintegrates when there is consistent seasons in 1846-47 of the failure of the crop. Uh, and she tells us that her husband James dies in March 1847, but she tells us that he succumbs to dropsy, which is a famine illness that has killed vast numbers of the many people uh, who died in Ireland. And so in Black 47, as it was termed in Ireland, this is the moment that switches their family fortunes and they go to America. And if I was in front of an Irish audience when I normally read these things out, I normally say, that's where we in Ireland leave the story. We go, isn't that awful? They were famine, ter terrible uh, victims of the famine and they had to go. But the story doesn't end for them. And, and they come over here and like many uh, women who are widowed, she marries again, she marries an Irishman. And you would think that she's had enough hardship in her life, um, but not so, unfortunately. Uh, in 1853, she marries Morris Kennedy. She has another uh, child, Morris Jr., born in 1854. Uh, but her husband is a alcoholic. He is a, uh, a, a violently abusive towards her. Uh, she moves away with him out of New York, uh, where we are told by her daughter that, that this habitual drunkard and man of bad character consistently inflicted in ill treatment um, on her mother. Six years of the ill treatment and brutality that he meted out towards her was enough. And in, 18, in 1859, her son Thomas, uh, the first, her eldest son, a tinsmith in New York, says, come back to New York, move into my tenement, live with me. Uh, and so she does so. She, she escapes away from this violent, abusive husband who disappears somewhere down in New Orleans. Uh, and goes into Thomas's house. Probably join the uh, first movie. <laughs> 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 Probably did. Uh, so, so um, in 1861, she's living with Thomas at 207 Mott Street. Um, but Thomas, uh, no, no, no real surprise, is obviously motivated enough that he's wanting to be in the 69 New York State Militia. And so, uh, despite his responsibility towards his mother. Um, he goes off to war and he writes to her from um, Fort Seward in Arlington on the 21st of May 1861 and he says my dear mother I take this opportunity of sending these few lines hoping that they may reach you in good health as I am at present when we took up our position on Arlington Heights uh, now we are building a fort to be called Fort Seward and it will be a large one and it will overlook the River Potomac and the city of Washington and if the enemy had it they could destroy Washington and Georgetown without losing a man Dear mother, we are in the center of the enemy and in the enemy's states. Today we have sworn in and we expect to be home marching up Broadway about the 9th or 10th of August. I remain your affectionate son till death, Thomas Madigan. Of course, they do go marching up Broadway, um, but Thomas Madigan is not with them. Um, he is felled by a bullet in the leg. Um, his limb was amputated. Um, there's no information coming back. She's consistently trying to find out what happened um, to him until um, in the 24th of August it's printed in the newspapers um, that he is in Centerville but had been moved to St. Mark's in Richmond um, and subsequently he dies of his injuries uh, and she finds out about this. But I do want to just touch at the end of this story, the story does not end here either. The story doesn't end on the battlefield for this woman. Um, and it's about the responsibility. There's an image of the emigrant leaving Ireland and then nobody ever hears of them ever again, right? And this is a false image. This is not what happened. That only ever happened if the person who departed didn't want to get in touch with anybody. Most of the emigrants who came here had a distinct financial obligation to the people left in their home communities. And it kept those communities linked across decades after the war. And so millions and millions and millions of dollars are being remitted back to Ireland by immigrants here. Because they are the ones, no matter what happened to them here, who were seen as the fortunate ones to have got out of Ireland. 
They're not seen as the victims who had to emigrate. The people who stayed are the ones who are seen as that. Um, and so she has to write when she's seeking her pension um, back to Ireland to seek proof of her original marriage um, to, to Thomas's father. And her sister is a domestic servant in County Kerry who writes to her in, uh, from Tralee in County Kerry on the 31st of March 1863. Um, uh, she proceeds to give out about the fact that she's given her son, her own son in Kerry money and he's just gone and joined the Union Army. Um, but we know what this woman's gone through. Her husband has died in the famine. Um, she has been physically abused and beaten. She finally gets away into New York and within months the son who she's living with is mortally wounded um, in the fields where we're standing. But this is what her sister writes to her um, from Kerry. And just this extract. And dear sister, I am sorry I ever sent you Jimmy and lost a few pounds to him just to be the mains, as they say in Kerry, be the mains of sending him to the war. I would want what I lost to him very badly, the money, now myself, for I'm getting into bad health every day. I am laid up at present with a scurvy in my feet and I will fear I have to leave my place in consequence of them. I have a very good place here at present if I could keep it. I'm living with Mr. George Hill Hilliard. Dear sister, I thought I would have got some assistance from you and Jimmy before now. Ye have made, as I thought, faithful promises but slow performances. <laughs> right? So she is chastising this woman for, for not sending money back to Ireland. And I think that's a very important fact um, to, to remember um, when we're thinking about all of this, this obligation that so many of them have. Later in the war, in 1863, um, the Irish Brigade and other units would be collecting money for the relief of Ireland. There's sketches of them before engagement. They're doing it just before Chancellor Hill, where these guys are putting money into boxes to be sent over to Ireland. And within weeks, loads of these guys are dead and Chancellorsville and Gettysburg. I often give it as one of the reasons that they should be remembered in Ireland because they support so much. Okay, so we'll leave